Our guest today is Patricia Thrushheart, who is a uh, award-winning poet and author, and she's going to talk about her uh, writing exploits. Say hello, Patricia. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks, Ed. Uh, well, it's been a few days since I've seen you, and I was wondering in the last week or so if you published any new books. <clears throat> uh, well, as much as I'd like to think that I have that many ideas and that much energy and that much time, no. I do write every day, though, and I definitely have some, you know, some irons in the fire. What's your most recent book that you've had published? Tell us about that. Well, uh, I write in two genres. I write poetry and then I write uh, historical nonfiction. And sometimes even in the nonfiction, I'll write fictional vignettes. So my most recently published book was a collection of poetry. Uh, it was called Sanctity, Poems from Northern Appalachia. And the book was written to a large degree in response to you know, the pandemic and the other stresses that we are experiencing uh, these last, you know, several months. It's, it's a book of uh, um, healing, and it's a series of poems that celebrate the beautiful uh, woods of northern Appalachia. So just as nature is healing, just as nature is soothing, so this book was meant to be soothing. The poems are not very long. They're not very difficult to understand. You know, they really reflect uh, the dynamics of the seasons of the of the forest here. And, um, you know, I published it and named it Sanctity for all of those reasons. So that's what was last published. Now I'm looking forward to a couple of new things. I do have a book coming out in the fall um, with Adelaide Books uh, in New York. The book is a historical nonfiction and it's especially interesting to people who are um, uh, living around Brookville, Pennsylvania, where, you know, where close to where I'm based, because it's the story of a woman who was married to a somewhat celebrity here in Brookville. It's the story of Marion Alsobrook Stallman, her life and tragic death. And it will be published, as I said, in the fall by Adelaide Books. Um, and it's, you know, it's a very, it's a very different sort of um, book for me. It's my first book of creative nonfiction or, or narrative nonfiction that will be published. So I'm looking forward to it. So I see you come out on the side of Appalachia as opposed to Appalachia. Yeah, <laughs> I was just reading about that. That's so funny you should say that. So supposedly there's some, you know, special line where if you live north of one of it, you're supposed to say Appalachia. And if you live south of it, you say Appalachia. And I know this is a, you know, a, a, a controversy that I hope is mostly in fun. But it was I when I moved up here, honestly, I never really had much occasion to say the word. But when I moved up here uh, outside of Cook Forest uh, and became immersed in the northern Appalachia community, began identifying as uh, a member of that community, um, I started saying Appalachia. <laughs> do you think that's right? Or what do you think? I've always said Appalachia, but... Because uh, mm -hmm. it's the Appalachian Mountains, mm -hmm. as opposed to the Appalachian Mountains. Although I suppose you could say it both ways. It's just, yeah. it's just uh, something I know that people say different ways in different parts. And I was just, that just caught my attention when you were saying it so mm -hmm. carefully. Uh, <clears throat> You've won a number of uh, prizes and awards for your poetry. Tell us about some of the poetry stuff that you've uh, submitted to and, and have won. Well, um, most of the awards that I've won have been through a couple of different poetry societies. And uh, one is the Pennsylvania Poetry Society. They have a contest every year. It has a number of categories that members and non-members can enter. 
Uh, many times those categories have themes or they have requirements about the form the poem must take, the, the length of the poem. And uh, you know they have monetary awards associated with them. And then there's also the National Federation of Poetry Societies, which is you know, the con collection of all of those poetry societies across all of the states here in the United States. And uh, they have really quite a comprehensive contest every year with some pretty noticeable, you know, dollar amounts involved. So in 2019, I won um, the uh, Diamond Tea Award from the National Federation of um, State Poet Societies. And it was a $500 award. Uh, and I won it with a poem about a cowboy. Um, that was their theme that year. And I had happened to write one, uh, surprisingly. And well, what do you know? It took first place. But um, I've had a number of other poems place across a number of their categories. I'm waiting right now for the results of the 2021 contest. I think I submitted about 30 poems all told across uh, you know, that many categories. So we'll see what happens. You're a member of a larger writing community in the local area. And you're, uh, I guess, one of the uh, managers of the Watershed Journal. Uh, tell us about the local writing community. I, I'm happy to because it's such a blessing, to be quite honest. Um, I, I remember, I think it was Dr. Phil Terman from Clarion University that joked about what in the world is in the water around here that has so many people interested in and writing. Um, I'm the board of I'm the president of the board of the Watershed Journal. Um, I recently uh, was voted into that position. Prior to that, I was serving as secretary. And of course, like you and like many others, I've, I've been a volunteer. Um, so uh, to my view, the Watershed Journal Literary Group is really at the heart of the Brookville uh, literary community. Um, and that's because of three things. Number one, they recently opened a bookstore and literary arts center on Main Street in Brookville. And um, it's been a wonderful experience. It, it clearly f filled a niche within the larger uh, Brookville area for a bookstore. Um, but it's run by volunteers. The books are donations from our generous community. We get a wide variety of titles and genres. We've gotten some vintage books that have been donated very purposefully. Uh, it also has the largest collection of works by regional authors. These are not used, these are on commission. But if you want to learn about the scope of regional authorship in the greater Pennsylvania wilds, the bookstore on Main Street in Brookville is the place to start. Um, and then we also have a literary arts center there. It's a place for writers to gather, uh, to become inspired, to collaborate. Uh, members can use the space for other purposes. I know NAFCO had a little film viewing there, which was delightful. Um, and then we also hold workshops. That's the really the third, one of the other legs of the stool, if you will. We hold workshops so the writers in our community can, can learn more about the craft. And then finally, as, as I think many of your listeners will know, the Watershed Journal publishes a quarterly uh, literary arts magazine that features photography, um, artwork and writing from the storytellers of our region. And it's an inclusive magazine. So while each individual piece is, is a story and, and, and is a voice, the collective voices in the journal really reflect our region. So, so that's one key component of the, um, of the community. There's also three writers groups functioning in the greater uh, area. Punxsutawney has one, the Stained Glass Writers, and uh, I often go to that. I know you have two. Uh, Writers Block Party operates out of Brookville, but draws from um, uh, people all over uh, the, the greater area. And then up in Franklin, uh, there's the Bridge Literary Arts Group. So uh, really a lot of things going on for writers. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Writers Association of Northern Appalachia, or WANA. Um, we are uh, really excited to be partnering with them. They're going to be holding a conference this September in Wheeling. But the membership of that group draws, again, from our same region. And they're really dedicated 
to uh, building a canon of works by writers in Northern Appalachia or Lecha, however you wish. <laughs> uh, all, all the people locally are wondering if you'd like, uh, if you quit beating your poor abused husband every day. <laughs> That's right. I mean, he's a poet too. Uh, Gerard Tornasol is his pen name. And, uh, you know, that means that, you know, it's, a, it's all about writing, you know, all the time around here, uh, which, which really adds another whole aspect uh, to it that I, I'm lucky to have. The Watershed Journal, how often does it come out? And uh... it's it's quarterly, and um, the best way to stay on top of what's going on with the journal is to is to check in on uh, either their Facebook page or their website, um, thewatershedjournal.org. So submissions open uh, quarterly, the two three weeks um, that uh, a writer would have to submit a work, and then uh, decisions are made pretty quickly by the editorial staff. And then we get to work on designing the magazine. I understand you are applying for some grants to try to get some uh, uh, money to pay for people to help run the bookstore, at least part of the time. Is yes, yes, yeah. I mean, we've been really people have poured their hearts and souls and time and books and goodwill and good wishes into the bookstore. But, you know, there's a, the operating the bookstore and really publishing the journal um, really falls disproportionately on a couple of shoulders, particularly Jess Weibel and Sarah Rossi, both of whom really are at the heart of what we've been discussing. Um, and, uh, you know, there comes a point when, and I feel this very keenly as the president of the board, there comes a point when you really do have to look for uh, opportunities to have uh, staff and, uh, and pay that staff. That, that is the, in the best interests of all of these uh, not-for-profit efforts I've just been describing, because that's what makes those efforts sustainable. You can't have these things happening based on individual heroics. Um, people burn out, people move, people, people's lives change. So I really do believe that making some of these uh, functions, uh, staff functions with some remuneration is an important part of the future of the literary group and its, and its, its efforts. Um. You've worked to help review and edit some of the other people's works recently. Tell us about your uh, uh, some of your editorial efforts. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I'm really um, qualified to be called an editor. I mean, I, I always admire people who have that kind of eye. I call myself a beta reader, um, and, and we all need them. It doesn't matter how many books you've written or how much experience you have or how much education you have um, when you're when it comes to your own work, a fresh pair of eyes, it, they're just so important. So I have been the beta reader for a number of people in the writers groups that I mentioned. Uh, it's always really a lot of fun to contribute to you know to those efforts people are always very grateful i know i'm very grateful to my beta readers and uh, you know sometimes i'll catch a, where a narrative is just not working um and they'll catch that for me when you're a beta reader you're you know you you certainly can note where you know something is misspelled or where a punctuation is missing or where a sentence is a little bit clunky but what you're really doing is trying to provide the writer with a reader's perspective, how readers are going, are responding to it. Because in the writer's mind, they know the story, they understand the flow, and their, their brain can play tricks on them and fill in the blanks. When a reader starts to um, go through the work, those blanks are blank. <laughs> so those are the kinds of things that come out with beta readers. Um, and I know my work has been much benefited from it, and I enjoy doing it when my time allows for others. 
um, in your writing process, you said you write every day. So uh, do these poems, do they just come to you? Do you struggle line by line to write them? Uh, uh, how does your whole writing process work? Well, poems don't, uh, poems do just come to me, as you're saying, they're an emo, they're my, they're, they're my emotional response to my world. Um, many times it'll, I'll write a poem in response to the physical beauty outside my window, you know, the hemlocks or, or, you know, the deer or the rain or whatever it is that just has taken my breath away. This change of seasons, like we're going through now. Sometimes poetry wells up in me in response to other emotions, like maybe what's happened uh, in our country or, or in response to something someone has posted or something I've read, even another poem. So poetry is always there for me. And when it wants to come out, it comes out. If I'm driving, I have to dictate into my phone. <laughs> um, if it's the middle of the night, I have to wake up. And, and luckily, my husband's a, a, a a heavy sleeper, <laughs> I can write it down. Um, nonfiction's different. Um, nonfiction takes research, and I probably spend more time in some cases researching than writing. <clears throat> it's amazing, you know, hours of research can result in two paragraphs <laughs> of writing, um, but it's so critical. And then I also do a lot of revision. Um, I do count that as writing because it's applying the craft to you know your first draft your second draft taking into consideration the feedback from your beta readers uh and and any peer reviews you might have asked for and so i do count revision very much as part of the craft so uh like i said poetry comes unbidden and cannot be denied and nonfiction is you know is a process that starts with research and one thing leads to another as part of a poetry community, so to speak, how do you see poetry as having changed over your lifetime and how is it changing now and what, in what ways and what direction is it heading? That's a great question. Um, and I do believe we are seeing a shift I think poetry became irrelevant for a long time in 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 our culture anyway in the U.S. Um, it got a reputation for being you know sort of ivory tower, maybe a little too pretentious. You know there was you know there was this drift away from form and rhyme into free verse, and and there was this shift into what I you know some very layered meaning if very very um, sometimes very obtuse writing. And I think a lot of people wrote poetry off as something you needed a master's degree to understand uh, that was really only for you know academia. And of course I'm speaking in gross generalities, but a few things have changed. One big change is performance poetry where almost it's almost like rap and poetry became you know, in, infused and um, people began standing up and performing their poetry in an extremely uh, dynamic way. And, and, and so people started listening to poetry and coming back to poetry and poetry, I've seen it become, you know, the, the megaphone for a number of, of social issues. And I think the culmination of that was um, uh, the reading of um, the poem at Joe Biden's um, inauguration, uh, just a phenomenal performance by Gorman. And uh, suddenly poetry is, is, is in the mainstream again. You also have Instagram poets and, and you know, there's some debate about, you know, um, you know, how they're, how they're impacting the genre generally, but, you know, you have um, poets like Cower, who have millions of followers. And the, her first book, uh, Milk and Honey, sold something like 2.8 million copies. I mean, just a phenomenal change in how poetry is, uh, is now much more part of the mainstream. For me, I wrote no matter what. I started writing poetry as a you know teenager. It was a 
it was an outlet for me as I went through all the typical teenage things, emotions being very heightened. And I never stopped. It never mattered to me whether anyone was going to read it or liked it or, or anything. Um, but I'm loving the fact that, you know, there are thousands of poetry journals to submit to. I, I would say poetry presses are out there to publish. Um, and um, it's never going to be the same as, you know, science fiction or or romance or some of the other really mainstream genres, but it certainly, in my view, has become way more relevant to many, many more people. Does, does that make sense? I, I think uh, the first really prominent person who was a poet that I remember, you know, a concurrent poet was when Maya Angelou was, was out writing, yes, and before that, I don't remember even thinking about any living poets. I'd read things like Coleridge and Poe and, and Whitman and stuff like that. But the, the current poets I didn't pay any attention to, to Maya Angelou. Yeah. She, oh, and what a voice uh, and what a story. Um, and, and she was also, I believe, Poet Laureate of the United States. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's a very important role to keep poetry relevant on the national stage. Um, so you had today we have, you know, the youth poet laureate, I already mentioned, Amanda Gorman, who's who read her poem at Biden's inauguration. And then you have Joy Harjo as uh, our U.S. poet laureate her second year. And she's uh, she is a Native American and and her the Native American experience drenches her poetry. I have her book, The American Sunset, I think that's the name of it, or Sunrise, I can forget which one, but it's all about uh, the story of the Trail of Tears and how it impacted her very family. So uh, Maya, uh, Joy, Amanda, these voices um, that are now, that have been uh, our poet laureates and, and, and really have stayed um, at the center of our understanding of ourselves from a literary perspective have been so important. I love all three of them. The uh, poetry seems to tend to have a, a more liberal political flavor than you see in the uh, general countryside around here. Uh, mm. Is you think that poetry is a political tool or a political expression as well as an artistic one? Oh, I think certainly for some authors, absolutely. Some poets, you know, they're writing about, they're writing about social issues. Absolutely. Um, but, but others are writing about love and others are writing about, um, you know, loss and grief. I mean, when you, when you really, narrow it down poetry is emotion um, it's it's using that particular craft to capture emotion um, when you read a poem that's doesn't it doesn't start from from a place of, of emotion which might be anger at a political situation uh, bemusement over a political position sure if it's without emotion it's sterile it, it and it comes across that way um, and in our community, I mean, we have, we have, we run the gamut. It, we have a diverse group of writers. Not everyone is, um, the, cut out of the same cloth, but, um, they're writing about, like I said, they're writing about love. They're writing about, uh, the human condition. They're writing about loss, grief, uh, you know, the kinds of emotion that poetry handles so well. All right. Do you... Do the poets who write in free verse and the poets who write in rhyme, do they have like these cage matches where they wrestle and, and fight? To <laughs> you know? Oh, that is a funny, that's a funny question. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> my, my view is any, dis every decision a poet makes should be a deliberate one, you know, and and whatever whatever a poet chooses, whether it's free verse or blank verse 
or a sonnet or an ABC Darian <laughs> or a villanelle. And whether a poet rhymes or not, that should all be um, a holistic decision about what they're conveying. Just like if I were an artist and I have the choice of pastels and watercolor and oils and, you know, I don't know, uh, ink. I'm going to, and I, I have a, I have a, an image in my head. I'm going to pick the medium that works for that image. Um, so that's, I would argue that. So I, I would argue that any poet should have any element of the craft available to him or her and that what should drive what he or she chooses is the meaning, the, the, the emotion, what, you know, what he or she is, is trying to convey. So I have written blank verse. I've written free verse. Um, I have been experimenting. It's funny you should ask this. I've been experimenting with a couple of other forms um, and I realized that I really should explore forms more because they're all about, they're all about enhancing the craft. It's like if you were a potter, you know, you may love most working with one medium and one type of firing, but to be a real diverse potter, you should know ceramics and you should know this kind of kiln and that kind of glaze, you know, it's an art form. I was just curious about that because if you look at, you said about artists working in different mediums and artists tend to produce almost all their work in one medium for like Perry Winkler, for example. He studied under a uh, pretty famous oil painter and he uh, dis discovered he loved watercolors and he's done watercolors ever since. So do poets uh, have a form? You, you talk about experimenting with different structures of the poetry. Do you think that some poets choose one form over another because they um, find that's the, the medium that tends to best express themselves, the form that tends to best, they tend to express themselves the best doing? I do. I think so. I, I you know, most poem, most poets today, uh, and of course, I'm not, you know, I'm not studying poetry like a, you know, a professor of English at a university might, so they can argue, can, you know, they can certainly argue with me. But I think most of the poets I read today are writing free verse. Uh, I think uh, free verse gives gives the poet the maximum flexibility. Um, when you start to write in a form, you, you know, you have some, some real restrictions, uh, what lines should rhyme, how many, you know, beats should be in each line, depending on what form you've chosen. Uh, you know, there's, there's some definite uh, restrictions. And while it hones your craft to, to write beautiful lines within that structure, you know, it isn't freeing in the same way that free verse is. So I think most poets that I read today write in free verse and free verse is expansive enough to, to you know, uh, embrace the thoughts of, you know, the thoughts that poem or poet has or the ideas that that poet has. Um, but I think many of the poets I read have experimented with other forms. Um, you know, someone like Elizabeth Bishop is a great example. Um, she wrote not just free verse, but she wrote villanelles. She wrote a sestina, which is often held up as an ex the best example of a sestina, which is a darn hard form to write. But what's most important is every one of those poems is absolutely gorgeous. Philosophically, then the uh, free verse gives you the greatest freedom to do what you want it does, it does. I, I see in arguments a lot of times in photography and even in videography about how people place limits on what they're doing because struggling with the limits either by limiting their equipment or limiting their subjects or a particular theme that by 
pushing the boundaries against those limits. They feel they're more creative than they are by just going out and shooting anything. Like uh, Galen Rowell, for example, is a, was a, a world-class nature photographer. And he did a series for National Geographic where he went out and he limited himself to, to take one photograph per day. You know, of all the photographs he could go out there, rather than just shooting zap, zap, zap all over the place, he limited himself to one photograph per day. Uh, some filmmakers embrace uh, like shooting on eight millimeter film because they like the way it looks and the and the and embrace the limitations of the form. And I was just thinking about the context within poetry of embracing a particular difficult structure and how that would affect your uh, creativity or, or uh, as opposed to not having a structure where you're more free to write what you want. It's an interesting idea, I think, to uh, how, how does a structure affect your creativity? It is. It's a very interesting idea. And, and I, I feel, in my view, certainly you, you start with the reason you choose a structure, a stru the structure should enhance, you know, the, the, the evocative, uh, uh, um, the evocative meaning of the poem. So, you know, so there, there may be topics or there may be um, feelings that a sonnet enhances and then there may be other topics or feelings that a sonnet would not enhance and so you wouldn't write a sonnet for that second you know that second um, type of feeling or meaning any more than you would use watercolor to paint I think a highly highly detailed uh, canvas that you want to almost look like a photograph it's just not the nature of watercolor so um so what I what I feel when I decide to write in a form is the form challenge and it challenges me and I think this is what you're getting at the form challenges me to you know to to write within its restrictions and and hone in on the exact right word or combination of words to 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 bring my meaning to you know to fruition um, and. You know, rhyme is an interesting challenge because, you know, rhymes can sound sing-songy, they can be predictable. Um, and so one other challenge of writing in a form that has rhyme is to, to come up with words that, that rhyme or, uh, and, and yet are not predictable or look like you only wrote that because you needed a rhyme, you know? Um, so I do think writing in form hones the craft and I, I notice after I've written in, in a, you know, played with a form, written in a form, when I go back to free verse, I'm that much more conscious of the choices I'm making, even in free verse. You were writing poetry in high school. And I imagine you had some poetry classes in college. When did you develop your appreciation for the genre aside from just you're playing it, writing it in high school. When did you start to appreciate poetry for the complexities that are involved? Yeah, um, I think it really all starts with just loving language. I love to read. You know, um, I read far more than almost anything else. And when I wasn't reading, I was playing the guitar and singing lyrics. So that's just poetry, you know, set to music. Talk about form and rhyme. Um, so it really all starts with being being a reader and loving language. Um, and I didn't start with poetry necessarily. You know, I was reading um, a lot of fiction, you know, as a young, as a middle schooler, a lot of British fiction in particular. Um, like, you know, I read Jane Austen a lot as a middle schooler. So I think it started with a love of language. And then when you love language, Poetry is like dessert, you know, uh, and you, you know, it, because it's so distilled, you know, it's so, it, you know, it, 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 every word, 
every word is is it has a concentrated uh, role in the in the piece. So I, I think I came to poetry later, and I think it really just came out of my love of language in general and my love of song lyrics. Um, so probably in my twenties, um, especially in college. So I went to the University of Pittsburgh as an undergrad. Uh, well, I ended up there. I started at Carnegie Mellon, but didn't like it for the humanities and moved to Pitt. And I had a wonderful teacher. Um, and it was, uh, his name was uh, Tobin, Professor Tobin. And he was an actor as well as an English professor. And he could read poetry like, like I've never heard. And it was me first hearing him read the 19th century romantics Actually, it was me first hearing him read on looking in Homer's uh, or in um, uh, in Chapman's Homer that I fell in love with poetry. I can actually just put my finger on the precise moment, and it was thanks to him. <laughs> so, uh, what projects are you currently working on? Are you coming out with a a poetry rap album anytime soon? <laughs> uh, no, you know. Um, I really admire the people who do performance poetry. I really do. And I love listening to them and watching them. I'd be lucky if I could memorize the first three lines of any poem uh, well enough to do that. Um, but uh, as far as poetry goes, I have uh, a couple of things in the queue. Uh, I have a manuscript uh, that I believe, you know, that I expect to be published. I have a commitment from a small press to publish it. And it is a manuscript of poems based on the witness of abolitionists during the Underground Railroad. Um, it's called Inspired, Inspired by Their Voices. So I'm working on, I'm working on getting that all finalized and, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. I also have another manuscript, which is called uh, Goddesses I Have Known. And this is a manuscript of poems that explore the feminine, uh, all different aspects of the feminine, uh, the feminine experience. Uh, a lot of these goddesses really aren't that what we think of as feminine, which I love. So that manuscript's been through a developmental edit. I'm, I'm incorporating those uh, recommended changes. I'm adding some poems. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun with this project. And then uh, you know I'll decide how I wanna get it out into the world. And then my nonfiction uh, project right now is really a ton of fun for me. It's, it's another book about a, a woman. She was born in um, 1865 uh, to a well-connected family in Philadelphia. And, you know, she was their only daughter and she was the only grandchild of a wealthy, a wealthy family. And there are ties to Pittsburgh, which makes it even more fun for me. Uh, her grandfather was a, a prominent attorney in Pittsburgh. Her aunt married an iron manufacturer and never had children and was extremely wealthy. And so this girl was, you know, the heiress of this family. And she was very good looking, uncommonly good looking. She had a killer wardrobe. She went to Wilson College as a 14 year old and later went to Vassar for two years. So she was extremely well educated. For, the, for that time. Then her family moved to Chicago just as uh, labor unrest was heating up even more, agitation for the eight hour workday. And what does she do but get involved with anarchists, um, specifically the Chicago anarchists, which was a group of eight men who were rounded up after a bomb was thrown it, uh, during a worker's rally and accused of murder. So her life changed materially and the life of her family. And boy, oh boy, it's, it's an incredible story. So, so I'm having a lot of fun writing that. It sounds like parallels with Patty Hearst and the Symbionese Liber Liberation Army in California. Yeah, well, she wasn't captured and held and she didn't, you know, she... It's interesting that what got her, what made her get involved, I think she fell in love. She fell in love with the, the lead anarchist. He was young, he was 32, he was good looking, he was German, 
but but bilingual. Um, he was an editor. He was quite the speaker. Um, uh, he had a charisma about him, and I think she fell in love with him. I guess uh, I'll end the interview. If you, is any final words, uh, acknowledgments to your uh, dog family there, anything like that? <laughs> uh, well, um, I try to keep my dogs out of my poetry just just because. Come on, how much <laughs> how much can you read about dogs? But well, those of us who love them love them. <laughs> I don't know. Peggy Zortman's had a books about her dogs, so that's true. That's very true. Well, her dog is a little bit more of an active dog than some of mine, but um, I'd say my final words would be, you know, thank you to you. Thank you uh, for having me and, and some of the other, you know, folks that you're talking about. I, I think this collaboration between groups like NAVCO and the Watershed Journal are really important because, uh, you know, no one group uh, uh, really can survive on its own. It takes this collaboration and that really is what brings the whole notion of our creative uh, community to fruition. And you mentioned the Winkler, you mentioned Perry Winkler and the Winkler Gallery. We've done collaborations with them. Um, and I think there's many more. So I'm excited about, about those possibilities. Um, and I, I believe they'll enrich our community. All right. Thank you, Patricia. I'll talk to you later.